This was not my fault. I went in because I wanted some Bonkers sock yarn. Every now and again, I get the desire to cast on and knit a pair of silly hand knit, not hand knit, hand dyed Bonkers colorway socks. It's, apparently it happens every spring. It could be a thing. That was my intention. But in the very back of the store, in a box that I didn't see on the first lap, there were seven skeins of Cascade 220 Sport non superwash in the color Doeskin Heather. And they were 30% off. I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? You, you can't not buy that, right? It was $31 for a sweater in non superwash Peruvian Highland wool. It's not my fault. I mean, except for the fact that it is. Now, I'd almost bought a sweater's quantity of this before, in fact, twice before, because at websyarn.com, who drive me crazy and I am not remotely recommending, but every now and again I do shop there, and if you hit a certain price point, you get 20% off. If you hit a much higher price point, you get 25% off, but it's worth it when I think it's 60 bucks, so you end up down at 48, which, I can get two sweaters out of that typically, which is, uh, you know, that's not a thing that we complain about. That only applies to full price yarn, not the clearance stuff, which used to be a lot better than it was, but I digress. So I've almost bought this twice because I really like the color. I love a heathered taupe. I have a problem. So I have almost bought this before and I had wavered between seven skeins or eight skeins because it could go either way depending on the gauge and the kind of sweater that I would make. Long story boring. It's not like it was an out of nowhere yarn. It's a, and it, it's a yarn I understand. It's Peruvian Highland wool, which I, I gotta be honest, I don't know why we don't give it more love, because holy crap is it soft. And it's soft because Peruvian Highland wool is a cross between Merino and Corydale, I believe. Now that I've said that out loud, I should have double checked because we're relying on my memory, which is not a good idea. But I think. I'll put something on the screen if I'm wrong. Is there anything there? Uh, I don't know. It's so soft. It is so, 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 so soft. It's so soft. And it's beautiful. So, I came home. I cast on in 3 by one rib. Why would you do that, you ask? Because I was influenced. Which doesn't happen very often, so I kind of crack up when it does. But Melissa, I believe her name is, from Knitting the Stash, if that's not your name, I'm sorry, but I love your podcast. You're wonderful. But she had recently cast on a turntable pullover by Albiona McLaughlin. And now it's intended to be knit in crazy, crazy hand tied yarn. It is so divine in a splattered all over the place colorway because it is all over three by one or two by two rib with some little lateral braids to separate your sections. It's a thing of beauty. And it reminds me she has a similar one that, oh, I don't remember her name, because me and names, of the Woolly Mammoth Fiber, Fiber Company. Lovely, is she Irish or English? Welsh? I don't know, she's somewhere in, in, in the UK. And, she knit an Albiona McLaughlin that is basically the same construction but in half fisherman's rib. So there are sort of two very similar but very different sweaters and I loved them both. And when I saw this, I was like, this would kind of be halfway between. I knew I did not have the yardage to do the fisherman's rib, like by a mile, but I should have the yardage for a three by one. So I swatched it, and I was mostly happy, but I, I guess I'm not used to ribbing, and you know how you can feel it on the back of your hand, and it, it, it sort of takes a little bit of the softness away? Now this is gonna be blocked 
sort of like this. Well, it's going to end up like this, but it's intended to be blocked open, right? Which some yarns will do naturally and some you got to work for a little bit. This yarn blocked open, but is now appears to have shrunk back. So I will have to probably end up pinning my finished garment, which we're not going to talk about. We're just going to pretend like that's not true. But I was like, I don't know, let me swatch it and stock it in. So I did. And again, because we have a merino and a slightly, well, it's not merino, sorry, Peruvian Highland, which is a merino blend breed, a merino cross breed. Yes, that would be the way to say it, a cross of a merino and what I think is Corydale, but now I'm wondering if it isn't Rambouillet. But you'll have seen it on the screen. I don't know why I am so rambly today. It's the weather. It's the weather and the light, because when the weather is crappy, I have to pull out the big light if you want to see anything. And it's very aggressive. So if I look at you all deer in headlights, now you know why. But I had to film today because I need the ball, ball yarn. I'm gonna need every inch of this to finish. But, so I swatched it in that, and it's not like there's anything wrong with it. It is pretty, but it's a little bit boring. It's just a little boring. The beautiful heatheriness of it doesn't seem to come through as much. I don't know why. I like this so much better. It's the same freaking yarn. But I mean, yarn and pattern, it's a thing. So after having swatched and waiting for this to dry, because it always feels like it takes forever, even though it's like a day, I said, screw it. And I cast on the turntable, which in fact you saw, if you watched the last episode, it, the turtleneck made a sneaky appearance. So yeah, I looked out, I got a huge score, a sweater's quantity or thereabouts. I'm, th I'm gonna make it. The only question in my mind is whether it's gonna be long enough. Because here's the tricky part about doing three by one rib. And actually I'm gonna measure this gauge now that it's sort of, when I first did this for the first week it was definitely a little bit more open, and because it was more open, the row gauge was shorter. And I knew how much it changed between washing, because I wrote it down. I remembered a thing! <laughs> so, that was useful. So, I can estimate my sweater is going to be, you know, 92% shorter than that I've knit it, and I can sort of figure out, I mean, I can mathematically figure out, but how that's going to actually be on my body is weirdly challenging. I mean, what I should do is I know my gauge, I can do the math, and I, it should be this, and I put a little marker, I put a little pin where that would be on the garment, and that should be where it ends. So that's what I'm gonna do. Thank you, that's a great idea. This is why we talk about knitting. But I haven't done that yet, so there's a sort of a, a bit of a chase going on. I'm really surprised that I used 50 grams for a sleeve, or just about. I've got maybe two, three, four grams left. I'm about to bind off my first sleeve. I thought I was going to use 40 grams. In fairness, the sleeves are like to here. They're really long. They're supposed to be really long. Hopefully that means they're gonna be about to here. Did I do the math? Of course I did. Um, we'll see. There's a lot of we'll see. And there's doubly amount of we'll see because I really am veering off the intention of the pattern in terms of it is meant for superwash merino. It is meant for sock yarn. And I am using basically the diametric opposite. I am using a similar breed, but in a very loosely spun, very loosely spun, loosely plied, and also loosely spun, because it really does. Like, you look at this, and it reminds me of that BFL, the Jaeger 
Jaeger, Jaeger, whatever it is. Not Jaegermeister, that's alcohol. Jaeger Spun, the Jaeger Spun BFL. It's not quite as, as, as loose as that, but it's not far off. The thing that makes me happy, though, I can't stop touching this stuff. I, I really, I walk by it and I just, I just kind of smoosh it. And then I walk by it again and I smoosh it again. And, and I can't stop knitting on it. This is probably going to be the fastest sweater on record. Which is annoying. I don't want it to be the fastest sweater. Hey, I'm not in no rush. There is no rush. But what are you going to do? So now I've shown you my swatches, and pretty soon you're going to see a lot more. Wow, was my rogue age off on this pattern. And I think I accounted for it, but probably not perfectly. Act surprised. So this is the Turntable Pullover by Albiona McLaughlin, which I have knit in Cascade 220 Sport in the colorway Doeskin Heather. And I'm really happy with how it turned out. I'm going to get that up front. It is not perfect. It is not exactly what I wanted to happen. But I love it, and I've worn it, and I like the way it wears, and I, and I do reach for it. So, imperfect situation, and worth discussing where I went wrong, but at the end of the day, I am actually very happy with it. So, if you're expecting drama, you know, I don't know, go watch one of the crazy people. So, my rogue age was so far off on this. And this is in part because this sweater was designed in a sock yarn. It, it's designed and looks really spectacular in bonkers, crazy colorways. There's something about the rhythm of it and the style of it that it, it really works. If you go to the project page and you look at the example one, I'm like, I want that exact sweater. I do. I would wear the, the heck out of that exact sweater. So, you know, I did not knit it. <laughs> in a superwash sock yarn. I knit it in a non-superwash pa Peruvian Highland wool, loosely spun, not tightly spun like a sock yarn. Um, now the upside of that is that this yarn is gonna wanna block open. So I did not have to stretch this to get, this is a, it's, it's a three by one rib that sort of you block open so you can see instead of letting it come together like ribbing. But when you have a non-superwash, loosely spun Peruvian Highland wool, it's going to block open without you really doing much of anything. It wants to sort of chill. So that was, that was part of the point for me. I actually, I, I don't really want to become involved in the pinning of garments unless it's, you know, some sort of spectacular fancy thing because I do wash these sometimes and I'm way too lazy. I'm <laughs> way too lazy for that. So, uh, it is, I don't know where I was going with that. It is. So I, and there were, there were, in fairness, one or two projects that did use this. In fact, I was partly influenced, which doesn't happen very often, so I keep mentioning it because I feel like um, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of excited about the fact that I was influenced. Uh, Melissa from Knitting the Stash, who if you don't watch, you should. She's fabulous. She's clever. And also, if you're ever looking for a knitting teacher, she runs courses. She's also a professor in university, so she's very good at explaining things to my from watching her videos, that's the impression that I get. I have not taken one of her courses, but I would definitely take one should I feel like I wanted to learn something. She'd be the first person I'd see if she had a course in that. So if you are looking for modification courses, if you're looking for anything like that, go check her out, really. Anyway, she knit one of these in, a, and also in a rustic yarn. Oh, and it was so beautiful. It's really, really good. And so I was definitely influenced. Um, I mean, I loved this sweater to begin with. Albion McLaughlin has two that are very similar, one of which is in a half fisherman's rib, one of which is in this three by one rib. Um, but there's differences in the details. So here, we'll have to, I don't know, I'll, you know what? I'm gonna have a picture, so I'm not gonna zoom in on my head. 
<laughs> but in the the neckline, you have different ribbing. You have different ribbing in the collar, all separated by these lateral braids. I I love the look of of the two ribbings together. There's I, I, Melissa changed it, and knitting the stash changed it. Uh, I didn't. I loved that. There's something about it that just really works for me. But the row gauge thing, because I was doing this, because I didn't have to block it open, and I'm assuming because she did, her stitch gauge and her row gauge, I almost matched stitch gauge. It was a little bit different, so that's easy math. But my row gauge was off by like 40%. My row gauge was completely different because I didn't have to block it out. And so I wasn't losing height to gain width in my stitches. Or, do you know what I mean? Like when you, when you block something wide, when you're sort of pinning it out so that you're getting that open, you're going to lose length. That's, there's, that's, that's physics, right? <laughs> or geometry or whatever, whatever branch of scientific things that is. And it's predictable. You, you can have an idea of how that's going to work with math. I don't bother. But what I do bother is trying to figure out, okay, how am I going to make my row gauge work? Now, theoretically, I could have shot for row gauge. And sometimes when you're knitting a pattern where row gauge is really important, this pattern row gauge is way more important than stitch gauge. It would be better to try and hit row gauge and then account for stitch gauge as opposed to the other way around. So if you're maybe knitting this in a superwash sock yarn, I would definitely recommend if, you're, if you can get row gauge, go for that. It's going to make your life easier. And then you will just maybe knit a different size because there is a lot of ease on this garment. So you have a lot of wiggle room. So the chances of finding a size that works out to the numbers you want with your different stitch gauge when you have the right row gauge, that's how I would go. But that wasn't going to happen because for me to get row gauge, it would have been, I would have been wearing armor. It, it just would have been too tight. I don't, I don't even, I don't even know how I would go about doing that. It would be madness. So I didn't try. I just figured, okay, I can account for row gauge. I don't mind doing math. This is all fine. So I did a lot of math. Um, and sometimes I did not quite math, which is the rough guesstimate math. So hang on. First of all, why is row gauge so important on this pattern? Uh, and I don't want to give too much away because it's a paid pattern and I want my lovely designer to make some money off this. Um, but the way that you construct this garment, I would call it a contiguous drop shoulder, which I don't know if that's actually a thing, but that's what I would call this construction, which is very clever and I like it a lot. But if you look, I don't know if you probably, can you see the seams? Yeah, you can see if I sort of do this, you can see there's a seam here and anybody who knows how to read knitting can say, okay, what's happening right here is that it's all body increases. When, a, when your increase rate is like this, that means you're only increasing for the body, right? If you're like this, you're increasing both. If you're like this, you're only increasing for the sleeve. So you can kind of get a sense of, of the general idea of how this is constructed. Fortunately, there's a couple of little details on this one that you will never guess that I was surprised to see when I bought the pattern. And it's really clever. It's really clever. So even if you get an idea of how this is constructed just by looking at it, you're not going to make the same garment, which I think is awesome. It's probably not great if you like to just wing patterns by looking at other people's stuff, but it's really cool for, I don't, I think it's really cool. Anyway, I'm rambling, going back to this. So row gauge is hugely important in this because you, where your shoulder ends up, if you <laughs> are in the wrong place, it's either going to be way down here or it's going to be way up here, neither of which is what you want. You want it to be where it's supposed to be, which you can see where it's supposed to be. So row gauge is hugely important. Row gauge is also hugely important in turtlenecks, especially in this situation. So because of the way this garment is constructed, 
you know how like if with a raglan you end up with a square neck hole right and you have to account for that with the circular yoke you end up with a circular neck hole like different constructions give you different shapes around the neck and you have to sort of make that shape fit the body that we actually have because the, if if it's you know if say you don't have short rolls on a circular yoke or you don't have short rolls on a raglan you're either going to choke yourself or you're going to have a u neck so these are these are things that we try to avoid by doing things like short rows or doing d different modifications to the shape to make it fit our body. This particular garment, because of the way it's constructed, you sort of have a slit neck. And if you have a slit neck, I, the, if you've ever, if you're a longtime viewer, you will remember that I did a pattern by Midori Hirose, not the ranunculus, I can't remember the name, the papus, the papus. And it basically has a slit neck, but it's it's meant to be like a boat neck situation with that slit neck. And so the fact that it's unmodified doesn't matter. Well, it's a little modified, but it's basically unmodified. But but it sits beautifully because of the weight of the garment. In this case, the weight of the garment is not in my favor. This garment doesn't weigh anything. It's a very loosely spun woolen. I think it's woolen spun. I could be wrong. It's it's so loosely spun that it's kind of hard to tell and loosely plied that it's kind of hard to tell. So I don't actually know, but it's a very airy situation. I, so, so this garment doesn't weigh a lot. It weighs 250 grams maybe. If I have seven skeins at five, 350 grams. Wow, really? Okay, so I can't count, but you know. But it doesn't, the, the weight of the papus, it, because of the way it's a very tightly spun sock yarn that I knit that out of. And so it feels like there's more weight and so that is pulling it down. This is sort of springy and wide and swishy. So I, I don't know why that happens, but it feels like it's actually pulling it up. It's also probably because it's, it's going wide. Nonetheless, so that makes the way that I'm constructing this turtleneck even more important. And the length of the turtleneck. Now, if, if I had made it longer and I was folding it over, you can see how differently the neckline sits between when it's folded over and when it's unfolded, the neck sits completely differently. I have a really short neck. I, I just, I've always had a really short neck and age does not help that. Um, and so I was being, I was erring on the side of caution. Now, when I first blocked this and it was, I sort of blocked the turtleneck together and it sat differently. But because of the weight of the garment coming here, you can kind of see how you get a little bit of stretch and spread on the sides above the shoulder because of the, the shape of the neck, right? And she, there are some things that are done to accommodate the shape of the neck. And there are some things that you simply can't be done, right? I suppose technically, you could have, if you wanted to fill the triangle gap, you could make some little short rows in the collar, um, but that would probably do something else weird. Like that would be interesting to experiment with if you, but it would be, it would also look weird. I feel it would, it would, it would, I, it, it wouldn't work. <laughs> anyway, I decided it wouldn't work. It might work for you, but I decided it wouldn't work. It would change the vibe too much. Um, and I really didn't want a double collar. I mean, I could do this as it is. You can still see my end is woven in, but not cut off. Um, I could do it like this. And it gives you sort of like a mock neck situation. But I didn't want the warmth of a double neck because this yarn is to me mid season. It's either going to be a layering piece where I would have a, a you know long sleeve underneath or something like that. Um, it's, it's more of a mid-season. It's not a winter, winter garment. It's a fall garment, a spring garment. And of course you can wear it in the winter with a big coat, but I didn't want, if, as soon as you put that double layer turtleneck on, to me, I, I don't get cold enough to justify a double layer turtleneck. So I made the choice to do this. Now, I'm not unhappy with the choice. 
it's not the most flattering thing on me. I knew it was gonna sort of do what it's doing based on the project photos that other people had done, so it wasn't totally a surprise, but I don't think I accounted well enough for it. Yeah, I think I probably could have done a better job. I'm not really sure how. I probably could have been more specific. Um, I also guessed there is some short row shaping on this sweater because again, my row gauge was so off. I did a percentage of that. That was roughly the same percentage as um, was written in the pattern. So it was roughly, but because of the way that my body is shaped, if I do all of the short rows in a beautifully written pattern, it tends to sit a little bit too high in the back for me. I don't, I don't know why, it just does. And so usually I will eliminate 10, 20% of short rows in any garment that has short rows and then I get a garment that sits the way that I want it to. That usually works. I might have not done that correctly on this one. That's also a possibility. So yeah, there was, there was a lot of, there was a lot of guessing and it's also because I've never done a construction like this. So if I were going to do it again, if I were going to do it again, I actually think that I would go more on the short rows and see what happens because I am not sure, I understand how the garment is constructed, but I am not entirely sure how changing that might affect how this is sitting. I know that it would obviously bring this a little bit lower. If this was a little bit lower and then the collar was a little bit longer, but then it would be like, I mean, it's already, you can see in the back of my neck, the difference. It could be that it's an insurmountable problem that my body type and this garment are not best friends. They're good friends though. They are good friends. And despite the fact that this isn't what I dreamed of, I dreamed of it being more like this and staying more like this as opposed to doing that. But trying to make a turtleneck do that, like I think you would have to also go down like an awful lot of needle sizes. I did do this at a much smaller needle size. I think I went down three, maybe four. I'd have to check the project page, but it was at least three needle sizes. I think it was US, was it US six on the body and US three? Maybe it was four. I could have used it was four. I did use fours. So maybe if I had gone threes and gotten this even tighter gauge, that could have helped. That's a good thing to remember. Note to self. <laughs> because I do think I'll knit this again, although I think when I knit this again, it is going to be in a high twist superwash sock yarn in a bonkers colorway. So a lot of what I've learned by doing this it won't really apply. I mean, some of it will, but mostly it won't. Uh, won't. Although, you know, in fairness, if I was doing this in a in a you know super wash merino, which tends to be less warm in my experience, so I could probably do a doubled collar, and it wouldn't bother me in spring. That's an interesting thought. I don't know, um, but I a hundred percent recommend the pattern. I love the sweater. Everything about it makes me happy. It's flattering. Well, I think it's flattering. And the, the rhythm of it is just really, really pretty. The, I, I, and it's also clever. And we, if you've been around here at all, you know that I like a clever design. And Albiona McLaughlin does tend to make some very clever designs. She really does know what she's doing. So, hugely recommended designer. Very recommended pattern. Watch your row gauge. Learn from my mistakes. I know about the yarn. Can can you see that? We'll we'll see if you can see that. Maybe oops, that's my hair. It it's pilling a lot. It's pilling a lot. Which I have heard. This is my first time using Cascade Two Twenty, but I'd heard that some of the colorways pill that especially in the sport, it, it is a very loosely plied and Peruvian Highland wool is a merino blend. So you have a lot of the qualities of merino. It's not entirely merino, but you have that softness. I would say it's a little more dry 
than straight merino. It's not scratchy, but there are sort of, it's a bit hairy. So if you have tactile issues, this is probably not a yarn I would suggest. If you don't have tactile issues, I definitely recommend it. If you don't mind occasionally having to depill your sweater because it's soft, it's wonderful, it's very happy making, but it is going to require depilling. And I've I've probably worn this sweater less than 10 times and I'm already this pilly, you know, in the underarm where there's lots of friction. In fairness, it's possible, and I have heard, I don't know if I haven't experienced it yet, but I have heard that it'll do a, you have to do a lot of depilling at the beginning, and then it kind of tapers off, which would make sense, because if you keep having to depill, eventually you would have no yarn left. <laughs> like, you wouldn't have a sweater. There's only so much fiber that can accumulate. So, fingers crossed that this will still be around and on my body in a decade. We'll see. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.